given all of our sin and brokenness, shouldn't we have to prove to God, prove to God that we're worthy of God? Paul says, no. All you have to do is have faith in Jesus Christ. My name is Father Mike Manning. God bless you. I think you're going to enjoy this program. I'm trying to understand a man by the name of Paul, St. Paul, uh, the apostle, the person who gives us so many messages every Sunday. I'm hoping that maybe we can get into understanding him in a deeper and richer way. Today I want to talk to you about me. <laughs> I, I grew up in a dysfunctional family. There was a serious problem with alcohol. People that I loved and relied on would slide into a sloppy, slurring, and all, all too often angry and abusive people. I wasn't able to bring other people to the house because I was embarrassed to have friends see the people I loved in such disarray. I spent a lot of time away from the home. The reality of addiction and the plague it puts on, on people is not only the person addicted, but on the family with whom they live. It's a painful and dangerous thing. In the frustration of trying to stop the drinking, I came up with a solution. <laughs> I started blaming myself for drinking. Um, I, I'm sure that I caused my parents and family a great deal of pain and suffering. But if I could become a perfect child, they wouldn't have an excuse for drinking. If I listened to everything that my parents asked me to do and did it perfectly, then I could maneuver things in such a way as to take away the struggle with alcohol. I became meticulous in an attempt to try to be the perfect child <laughs> with simple, simple commands like, make sure you clean the sink in the, bed, in the bathroom. I spent half an hour making sure that the sink was perfectly clean. My, my solution seemed rather harmless and actually on the right road. The problem was that in the confusion of the situation, I also had to deal with God. And I learned in school that God was very demanding. God wanted me to follow the Ten Commandments. That meant honoring my father and my mother. That meant making sure that I didn't steal, lie, or allow any impure thoughts or actions. In a fascinating way, this combination of trying to be perfect for my family transferred into trying to be perfect for God. <laughs> Unfortunately, all this religious goodwill turned into a nightmare of an obsession that took hold of me. I found myself obsessed with the desire to do things to try to stop drinking in the family. But at the same time, I tried to start doing things, obeying the commandments, to please God. And because I repeatedly fell short of being perfect, I slowly but surely moved from a loving, merciful, and forgiving God to a God of judgment and anger. <laughs> I took on, on an understanding of God that, that demanded that I do all kinds of things to prove my love for Him. I was forced to, to do things to ensure that I wouldn't go to hell. <laughs> I'm happy to say that things turned out well despite my struggle. My relationship with God became so much better. With a wonderful movement of grace, I came to know God's overwhelming mercy and love and forgiveness of me. I knew God was love. This is the God that I know today. I, I don't mean that I no longer have to follow the commandments and be obedient as I should, but the overwhelming reality of my life 
is a deep awareness of God who loves me, understands me, and with whom I can have a deep bond of personal friendship and intimacy. I share this, this confession with you of my deep pain and struggle as a way of explaining why I'm so attracted to Paul and his teachings. Paul also experienced the God of commandments, justice, and overriding demands. He was obsessed with the legalistic understanding of God. I believe this obsession was part of his deep desire to root out and even kill Christians, followers of Jesus, who were going against God with a belief that was blasphemy. But then he had an encounter with Jesus. The encounter was a personal, intimate understanding of deep love, forgiveness, and acceptance. Jesus opened the door to Paul's understanding of God as a loving, dear friend. This experience allowed Paul to understand God the Father with the new insight of, of patience and tender care. This whole relationship with the fearsome God of commandments and then the God of deep love and care was seen in Paul's struggle with the Jewish law of circumcision. Going back to the time of Abraham, our father in faith, God demanded that all followers should be circumcised. All Jewish men were to have the foreskins of their penises removed as a proof and a commitment of a person's mind, heart, and body being totally given to God. Circumcision said that individuals of the Jewish nation were God's chosen and protected people despite all the adversity and persecution that surrounded them. After encountering Jesus, Paul began to travel around the known world preaching the love of Jesus. He began with Jews who were people from whom Jesus came. But then, in his fire to touch as many people as possible, he began to work with Gentiles in present-day Turkey, Greece, and later Rome. As he tried to encourage many people to accept Jesus, it was quite natural, since Jesus was a law-abiding Jew, that any follower of Jesus would also become a Jew <laughs> with all the demands of commandments, feast days, and circumcision. These demands became a terrible obstacle for Paul, getting Gentiles to accept Jesus. The appeal of Christianity was very strong, but then, because the Jewish demand for circumcision, many Gentile men refused to embrace Christianity. Paul and the church prayed to the Holy Spirit to understand if these, if there, somehow there could be a way of somehow overcoming this change that would enable Gentiles to become Christians without having to follow certain laws and regulations, fastings, pilgrimages to Jerusalem, and, and especially the circumcision of men. Paul searched the Hebrew Bible. Jeremiah spoke of the importance of circumcision of the heart rather than circumcision of the penis. 
circumcision, circumcise yourself in the Lord and remove the foreskin of your heart. Jeremiah 4.4. 4. Would it be possible to understand circumcision as the dedication and surrender of one's heart to God without having to go through the physical operation of circumcision? Paul believed it was possible. He came to the leaders of Christianity and presented the need of a new way of thinking. After much prayer, there was a monumental decision. Following the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it was decided that a follower of Jesus did not have to obey the strict Jewish dietary laws, the attendance at Jewish celebrations, and the need for physical circumcision. Rather than the legal circumcision, Paul said that the overriding proof of one's being in the right way with God was through responding to the gift of faith in Jesus. With this faith, one was able to let go of legal demands and, and find the peace and security of reconciliation with God through Jesus. I have a wonderful gift that I want to send you. It's a gift called Jesus Calls Us to Change. Ooh, change. This is one of the real words that's echoing around our country, echoing around our world. And it's fascinating. We have kind of like a, a love-hate relationship with change. Ooh, we like to change, but at the same time, so much of our life is getting out of ruts. We get into ruts. We're get, getting used to things. And yet, if we really are followers of Jesus, we know that Christ came into our world, looks us right in the eye, and says, you need to change. And that's what this book is going to give you some insights into it and courage to be able to make that risk of getting out of the rut, getting out of the things that you're used to, to allow something fresh and new to happen. I believe that this can change your life. When we look at this, the life of Jesus, he called us to change, to repent, to accept the good news, to turn our lives around from where we're going, sometimes with sadness, and lack of direction to a new hope. And so if you're, if you're reluctant about that, if you're, if you're fearful of change, I believe that this booklet can be able to give you new hope. I talk about ruts, I talk about the ruts of the addiction of sin and sometimes the struggles we have of changing our lives, of moving away from things that we're used to doing and really believing that I can be free from sin. I can be free from those things that are habits that are holding me back and allow yourself to enter into the, the big meaning of what Christianity is, which is change, repent, accept the good news, allow the love of God to enter into your life like it never did before. Please, this can change your life. Get it right now, please. Believing that faith in Jesus is all we need to be justified is simple, but it's also difficult. There's a surrender. We have to believe that God's love and strength is more powerful than anything I could ever do or try to do, anything that I could try to prove to make me justified and right with God. I have to quietly believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Our sins are paid for. We become adopted children of God. We are members of God's family, like, like a babbling child. We can now look to God the Father and call him Abba. <laughs> this surrender is very difficult, given our egos, our insecurity, and our awareness of past sins. <laughs> Oftentimes, we find ourselves struggling with God's love, acceptance, and justification through Jesus. This faith in Jesus, which brings us the peace and joy of being justified, being made right with God, all too often has doubt pushing itself into our lives. Doubt, doubt is a human reality that we, we can't escape. Let's pause for just a moment and wrestle with that word 
that word doubt, and see if, if, if given our natural proclivity to doubting, we might turn doubt into something which is a positive, a, a blessing, something that strengthens our faith. There are times in life when for even a mature believer, things don't make sense. Maybe something happens which left you scratching your head and saying, where was God in all of this? Or, or maybe you were praying about something and God just didn't, didn't seem to care. He was silent, sitting on his hands or dragging his feet. Moments of doubt have you wondering if God is paying attention. Listen to this. Doubt is part of faith. With the right attitude, doubt becomes the fuel that strengthens our faith. We find examples of doubt repeatedly in the New Testament. Zacchaeus, the husband of Elizabeth, doubts that his wife could become pregnant. Uh, then Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, and he asked, Who oh, could I come out and join you? And she said, Yes. He got out on the boat and started walking on the water. And then he looked down, and he said, Oh my gosh, I'm walking on the water, and he doubted. Uh, Peter started to sink. Judas doubted Jesus and even became a traitor. Thomas, the apostle, he doubted Jesus' resurrection. The proper understanding of the word doubt for Christians centers around the word attitude, attitude. Doubt is certainly going to enter our lives. The question is, do we have an attitude of hopelessness or an attitude of deep faith in God despite our doubt? The wrong attitude towards doubt can be very destructive. It, it can overshadow the reality of hope. But with the right attitude towards doubt, we can see it as the foundation of strengthening our faith. We wrestle with those things we doubt. With God's grace, we're able to understand and come to a new and more firm stand in our faith. Ah. The, the key to peace and security in our lives, according to Paul, is very simple. It's very simply, we have to place our faith in Jesus. Faith becomes the anchor, the, the foundation on which we build a life of joy and fulfillment, d despite the inevitable doubts that arise in our hearts, both because of our personal sinfulness and, and then the doubts and confusion of the people around us. We're still called to have a strong stand of faith. But then in the midst of all of that call for complete faith, Paul says a challenging thing in his letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, he says that we must, get this, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The, the working out that he mentions seems contrary to Paul's strong desire. Uh, to not have to do works like circumcision in order to attain salvation. And then in the midst of his call for deep confidence in the power of Jesus to bring salvation with our response of faith, he throws in the words fear and trembling. In his epistle, John says that perfect love casts out fear. And here we have Paul admitting to the reality of fear in the context of our surrender in faith to Jesus. How do we respond to that? In my heart, I know that my faith in Jesus is an assurance of God's love and promise to be with me now and forever in heaven. How much 
as always, I'm filled with all kind of questions uh, that when we start talking about justification by faith and these words of Paul of making sure that we just surrender our life, not, not trying to prove anything, not, not by going to church and going on a pilgrimage and doing this and saying, oh God, I'm going to do all these things and then, then God's going to look at me and He's going to like me. No, no, no. All you got to do is in the quiet of your heart, admit your sinfulness and then say, Jesus, I believe in you, and you nurture that faith, and you allow it to grow. I've got questions. I've got questions. I wonder, and I'm hoping that what I'm saying to you maybe will get you maybe talking with someone else about what I've just said in this justification of Paul. Or maybe you're going to listen to my program in a, in a little prayer group. Maybe these would be questions you'd want to ask as you're wrestling with this. Why have you decided to put your faith in Jesus? Kind of a fundamental question, isn't it? But something that I think you should ask yourself. Here's another question. Do you struggle with trying to prove your worthiness to God in order to ta obtain salvation? What have you been doing, perhaps aware of the deep sin that you have in your own life, the failings and the, the in, not just sins of the past, but sins which seem to keep going on and on, and you can get overly well, overwhelmed and discouraged and think, oh, I'm worth nothing, I'm not any good. Can you believe in God's forgiveness, and can you believe that all it takes is saying, Jesus, I believe. I give you my heart, I give you my mind, I give you my soul, I give you my whole being. Boom. Well, there's another aspect of this whole thing, and that's, as I was talking to you about my own life, of my concern to be legalistic, and I became obsessed with laws. Are you, you legalistic about certain things? Are there, are there laws that you've put on yourself, or perhaps others have put, that say these laws are more important than the people that you're supposed to love. And here's the last one. No, this is, this is interesting. I tried to exp talk about doubt and the importance of doubt being a reality in our life, but at the same time something that can be very positive. If I ask you this, how would you respond? Does faith or does doubt have a place in your faith? Please think about that and wrestle with it. And even though it might be pushing at you a great deal, let, let the doubt with the right attitude be a growth to deepening your faith and love of God. I have a wonderful gift that I want to send you. It's a gift called Jesus Calls Us to Change. I believe that this can change your life. When we look at this, the life of Jesus, he called us to change, to repent, to accept the good news, to turn our lives around from where we're going, sometimes with sadness and lack of direction to a new home. I talk about ruts, I talk about the ruts of the addiction of sin and sometimes the struggles we have of changing our lives, of moving away from things that we're used to doing and really believing that I can be free from sin. I can be free from those things that are habits that are holding me back. And allow yourself to enter into the, the big meaning of what Christianity is, which is change, repent, accept the good news. Allow the love of God to enter into your life like it never did before. Please, this can change your life. Get it right now, please. The foundation of our faith in Jesus becomes the, the anchor, the, the, the foundation that allows us then to be people who do religious things, that pray, that, that goes to church, that goes out of our way of trying to be a Christian presence to uh, the people nobody else likes, maybe at a nursing home 
or a person on the sides of the street that, that's lost and confused. We reach out, but it's now because of that, not proving to God, but the confidence of my faith in Jesus that allows me to do this. Now, I, I know that you and I struggle and, and sometimes doubt becomes strong. But I really believe Jesus is the answer. And just in the quiet of our hearts, if we do that, our lives can be changed. We can become new people with confidence and peace and direction. Now, that means also that we're going to be able to pray. That means that we can be able to come to this God knowing that he's not the fearsome God that I went through those times of seven years of fearing he was going to throw me into hell. But he loves me. And when I pray, he hears me. And would you, would you share with the, the team of people that are here right now, they're, they're at the phone waiting to hear from you. They want to pray with you. And they want to be able to, to say words to you that are going to give you the confidence that you need. And, and I want you to pray not only for yourselves, but pray for Peggy in Kentucky. Um, her home was destroyed by a flood. And here's with an email, which is great. Um, and he's praying that, that he can be able to overcome the alcohol. This is from Mark. Um, Ed, John is praying for his friend Ed, who is very close to death. Charmaine in Colorado. Um, Oh, she wants to pray for her mom and the difficulties of the family. Here's California and Virginia. May Jesus' love for you always make you smile.